Ready? I'm on the way. Hey boys and girls, today we're going to be talking about the Tesla plaid seats. And we're lucky enough to have Carl, who's uh, now a star. I mean, uh, when people are saying, Sandy, you should give it up and let Carl do it all. <laughs> I knew, I knew the end was nigh. So anyways, um, Carl and I are going to talk a little bit about the rear seats and then Carl is going to take over. So um, anyway, one thing that we did notice uh, and I've complained about is that the back seat mm, is um, not as comfortable as maybe what it should or could be like. And I had an awful lot of trouble with the seat belts. Um, so the first thing that I got to tell you is that I got uh, word back through the grapevine that um, Tesla has decided to um, has decided to redesign the seat belt uh, arrangement so it makes it easier to basically click in. So I'm very happy about that and I'm hoping that maybe they'll take a suggestion or two on the rear seat and see what they can come up with there. Now uh, I'm only going to talk about the comfort of the car, nothing else. And if we come in here and I sit down, okay, it feels okay when you first get in, but you'll notice that there's a big gap here between where my feet could be and where that seat is. And so um, we work on airplane seats and whatnot, and, um, and to make it more comfortable, which is not saying much, but uh, to make it more comfortable in an airplane, what we do is we move it forward and rock it back a smidge. Now, that is not what you want to do as a rule in a rear seat because it costs a lot more money. But if, if um, Tesla could do something that would rock it back or push it forward and rock it back, suddenly my seats, uh, this seat is going to be working on my, the underside of my leg. Um, I know that that's going to add cash to the cost of the car, but the only other option that I can think of is, if it's possible, to, uh, uh, to move the seats inboard and turn it into a four-seater instead, instead, instead of a five seat vehicle. Um, the uh, cup holders and, and whatnot would have to move to the door and it could even get more expensive. So it's hard to say what Tesla is going to do or if they're going to do anything, but there's a couple of suggestions. So that's all I want to talk about really for the rear seat until we get into it. Um, was there anything you wanted to add there, Carl? Well, in sitting in this seat, I am just over the body size of the 95th percentile male. Mm. And sitting in the seat, in order for my back to completely feel the support that the seat is giving me, you will see that my head is more than pressing into the roof. Yeah. And I am pretty much well above the headrest. But that is a factor of my body size. And well, would I but be the thing is, position? I am 95, at least the top half of my body is. And when I sit in here, if I'm sitting in the seat, you can see the gap between my leg and the, uh, and the, uh, and the cushion. And um, I've, got, I've got like two inch, uh, inch and a half, something like that between my head and the, uh, and the uh, roof. But, like I said, if I could move this forward even two inches, I, all I'm saying is let's not fiddle with the latch. What I'm saying is what happens if we pull the seat forward? Now, again, people are going to say, well, wait a minute. If I do that, the front seat, blah, blah, blah. But somewhere along the line, something has to happen in order to get uh, the kind of comfort that I think that the plaid should have But in the back seat. But... Um, Again, uh, we're not making those corporate decisions. Of course. Um, uh, but I think that uh, I think that ultimately that would be um, a good uh, a good plan. Um, so, anything else then? Do we? I do like the cup holder. It looks nice. It's a little too low for my arms as an armrest, but it looks really nice. The switch to activate to fold down the cup holder is actually embossed into mm -hmm. the vinyl here, which is quite yeah. nice. It keeps it. Yeah, you can Clean. hear it whizzing there. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's, it, makes a, it makes a little noise. You can hear it locking and unlocking. So, um, 
I think that, um, but, but if you look at the seed, it's really well made. We're going to be doing a detailed version of this as well. The seed's really well made. Um, there's a lot of things that I like about it. I just don't want to sit here for a long time. And I think that there's potential to, uh, to make it feel a little bit better. So with that, um, what I'm going to do is, um, is get out of here. And, um, and I'm going to leave, and Carl's going to take over. So <clears throat> I'm just going to get on my, uh, my little bicycle here. And Carl, uh, good luck. I know you'll Thank do you. a good job. Yes, and don't forget the revisions. I, I really think that the, um, the way that Tesla is doing revisions <sighs> is brilliant. Okay, and I'm just going to get out of here now. So, see, whoops, see you around, boys. So what we have here is most, but not all of the components of the front seat. Um, have one completely assembled, another one torn apart, and we're looking at the different aspects of the seat. Now, when I look at a seat, I think for a vehicle, the best comparison is actually the vehicle body. And what do I mean by that? I have five sides of this seat, which are considered a surface. Top, sides, rear, all of this is enclosed. All of this is wrapped, a surface all the way around, just having mechanical exposed on the bottom. And that's the same thing when you look at a vehicle body. You have the hood, the roof, all of the doors, the tailgate. And when we go across that vehicle body, we're looking at all those gaps to see how well they were able to bring all of those surfaces together and make them clean. You have a little bit more freedom with a sewn seat cover, however. Um, there can be quite a bit of tolerance differences in the sewing and stitching and the wrap attachment, but there is still a limit. We have a bunch of different components that are all working together. We have the structure supporting the seat. We have the foam supporting all of the bolsters in the STO shape. We have a back panel that is closing out a bunch of attachments. We have side shields that are covering up different mechanisms, the buckles. All of those things working together completely surrounding this vehicle. It is a little bit of a different animal. If you compare it to a door panel, you're working from structure out. From an IP, you're working from structure out. I consider those one-sided components. A seat is not a one-sided component. Now, as I said, I was or am right around the 95th percentile male. So in my past life, when we were doing seating, I was one of the guinea pigs. We would have us sit in the seat. We would put pressure mat uh, material on the seat. And as you were sitting there, you would move to get into your most comfortable position. And then everyone else who was doing the analysis was looking at a video screen showing basically your entire backside anatomy blown up to see where all of your pressure was being applied. It's not a very flattering thing to do, uh, but it really tells you what that seat is actually doing. Now, in my mind, the number one function of a seat is as a safety device. Everything about that seat supports that in safety. Um, the position, the angles, all of that. Now, the comfort. Why does that comfort matter that Sandy was talking about? Because if you're uncomfortable, you're going to shift and you're going to be in that seat um, in a bad position. We would normally call that occupant out of position. During a crash event, if you're an occupant out of position, that belt is not going to work properly for you. Um, it may actually harm you rather than help you. So by having that seat as comfortable as it can be in the design position, you can have a much, much safer vehicle environment. So we have a seat back, we have a seat bottom, we have side shields. What are the things that they did on these individual components that I think was unique? All right, side shields. We have different types of mechanisms and tracks that are being covered up by side shields here. You'll see seat side shields on a lot of different vehicles. Uh, as you are entering this vehicle, you have ingress and egress. So you're going to be sliding over this bolster coming in. If you were to angle down this seat, you will see that this side shield is very, very planar in relation to the bolster. Now, how does that help? You don't really want to load onto that side shield. Some vehicles you'll see, they'll have a big return biting in. You can load right on that component. The attachments will break off, it will stress whiten, you'll have a kind of a mess. By keeping this as flat as you can, you actually eliminate loading directly on the side shield. That's very nice. Now this side shield has two components that are being snapped together. This interior portion, lots of people will call this the shark fin feature. 
That is there because depending on what seat angle you have, you're gonna open up visibility here. Now, you'll notice that the inside shark fin and then the outside sheet, uh, seat shield are actually overlapped over top of each other. I like that. I've worked with a lot of companies where they try and clamshell it to where that seam is right planar, nice, tight, even with each other. Now the problem is if one of the components is just a little off, or if one of the components is gapping a little bit, you end up seeing that line and it just doesn't look right long term. You have to be perfect in your injection molding for that feature. By shingling them over top of each other like this, you actually have some tolerance. It can be off a little bit and you're not going to notice. It will still look nice. So I like the way they shingle that side shield. Now in the side shield, they have a pass through for the belt. This is a little odd. When you're injection molding this part, you have the main tool that is opening this way. You have the core of the tool coming out this way. But look at this belt pass through. That belt pass through is on a slide. It is moving in a different direction. In order for that to move on a slide, you have a parting line. Can you see this line through the camera here? That is an A-surface parting line because that is two different chunks of the steel tool that move independently of each other. Normally you want to avoid any type of an A-surface parting line. They're very difficult to manage. Um, some tool shops will say, well, we have a zero parting line condition, blah, 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 blah. It is still visible, but this one is rather good. I don't feel it. I don't feel a burr. I don't feel flash in injection molding, which we would call, but the line, it's still there. So we have a seat structure. We have our seat tracks. We have the main lower mechanism. We have the back frame. In talking about this structure, this is where you normally want to have some sort of a core commodity. If your structure can be the same between all of the different versions of your vehicle, you're going to save a lot of money in tooling. You're going to save a lot of money in complexity. There are some take, uh, giveaways, however. This seat structure, I went and I checked the Tesla Model Y and I checked the Model 3. It is the exact same part number for all of the vehicles, including this high-end version. Now, I went and I looked at the part numbers of the individual stamped materials, and even though they are the same part number, I've seen that they are multiple different revision levels. So they have gone through and they have done changes along the way from the other models. Now, exactly what those changes are, I do not know. They have, may have changed their parameters for their welding. They may have changed uh, length of a tab feature, a stamping hole. In my review, I really could not see very many differences in them, but they were able to carry over the same structure. Now, these are sedans. That works because of the angle of the seat. You'll notice the angle of this seat. We have that seat back, which is fixed to the angle that is allowed by that frame. If this was an SUV or if this was a truck, you're going to be sitting up much more vertical. That structure may not work in that case. It has a certain limit. It has hard stops in the steel. So there's only a certain path that it can travel through. So wherever you want your main home position to be, you normally want your hard stop to be center in that position. If we had to change this angle for a different vehicle, it's going to limit the amount of travel that you have in that other model. Um, they might be able to do it they, with some minor changes. They could change just some individual components of this stamping, keep it all together, that would be fine. Now this seat, again, as I said, it's a safety device. If you were coming over here and you were looking at the angles that are being created, when you sit down on this seat, you're going to sink into this foam you see the path and the angle of the seat pan. You see where the seat belt itself is and how it is holding you in this seat. During a crash, you want to stay in the seat. This seat is trying to hold you firm. However, during a crash, your body is a free moving object. G-forces are gonna be throwing you forward. Now, what is catching you? Your belt is catching you and that front of that seat pan. You want that front of that seat pan to be tipped up and you don't want too much foam here because what that is, it's called an anti-submarining feature. It stops you from sliding underneath your belt and then your knees going up into the dashboard. 
That seat pan is here. You can see the structure and the angle in the structure, how the foam relates to it. You are loading onto that steel, not sliding off of that steel. Um, it's an important feature of a seat. Now into the seat bottom. All right, we have a poured foam. It has a scrim layer. The scrim layer is what is contacting your seat pan because the foam can actually degrade and wear over time. This scrim layer helps to hold it all together to keep this from breaking down. We have a plenum. This is what's providing your air movement if you had cooled seats, fan and seats. Now, this is actually a fairly nice one, nice big open cavity, um, direct airflow all the way up to your backside. Um, I, I like the way they were able to integrate that, having clear open channels right up. It's quite nice. Your seat back. So we talked about the structure. Same issue with the foam with the scrim material, but this is a different material, much more rigid. Um, I would like to know where their reasoning was behind that. It may have been the suspension mat or the uh, lumbar support needing that more rigidity. Uh, your seat cover, your attachments here are Velcro. So those sunk in portions, you have to, sometimes they'll have little uh, molded in clips into the foam. You'd snap your cover into the clips. These ones are able to actually grab with Velcro. Quite nice. Your seat back panel. I was looking at this back panel and I saw something kind of interesting. It's unique to me. I have not seen it before. I don't know if I like it, but let's look at it. Here's your back panel. You have lower hooks, which are going to grab into your structure. Normally what a uh, seat would have is you'll have hooks on one side and then you'll have some sort of a snap feature on the other. It would either be a molded in snap or it would be some sort of a purchased fastener. Uh, that's helpful. So in the plant, they would hook onto the one side and then snap in onto the other. This does not do that. The upper attachment is actually the headrest. The components in the pipes of the headrest, there's a plastic component as well, actually enter through the seat and lock into the seat back panel. All right, what does that mean? It means you don't have to purchase additional fasteners. So purchasing in the assembly plant, they're quite happy with that. I don't have to buy those components. You don't have to worry about molded in snap features breaking on the assembly line as you're trying to pop in a panel and then you have scrap there. But what it does cause, now I have to load this seat back, hold it in place while I'm fitting in the headrest. They may have some sort of a fixture that is helping them do that, not really sure, but on the back end, if I was at, let's say an automotive upholstery repair facility, and someone brought in their Tesla and due to ingress egress, they have ripped or torn a bolster that they need repaired. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab that seat back panel and I'm gonna start tugging on it until I feel the snap features that I can pop off and then remove the hooks. If you try doing that with this seat, you are going to break the back panel. And an evidence to that I have right here, the Tesla Model 3 back panel. I wanted to see what the differences are. Overall, it has the exact same type of features. And when Monroe was removing this, we broke it. You can see these features are snapped at their base on both ends. We didn't know, we were trying to remove it, we broke it. So if you happen to bring one of these into a, not a Tesla service center, but an aftermarket service center, uh, make sure that they're aware of that so you're not buying more components than you need to purchase. So I was looking at that back panel. All right, we have the Model 3 here, we have the Model Y here, but look at them. This is a wrapped back panel, vinyl wrapped back panel. This is an injection molded ring. This has a matte pocket, all right? Tesla uh, Model S does not have a matte pocket. 
So here's the question. Is this a feature that you want to pay for? How often do you use your map pocket? Do you use it what it's meant for? Do you just stuff tissue in there? I've had this discussion quite a bit when we were talking about high-end vehicles. Um, there are several high-end vehicles that I've worked with that no, they do not have map pockets. No, they do not have storage bins. No, they do not even have glove boxes in some of them. Is that a feature that provides a benefit? So what am I paying for? I'm paying for an injection molding tool that can do this entire back panel. Even though I'm of the exact same size, I have a missing center. This is one injection molding tool that fills in it all. On this component, there is another ingestion molding tool that does the center. So now I have two tools that I'm paying for. Then I have a piece of vinyl, double layered for the mat pocket and the mat pocket inner, all being heat staked together. More than likely, even with the wrapping, this is possibly of a higher cost to produce than the back panel that we see here on the Model S. Another thing, the back panel itself, what is it made out of? This is polypropylene. Normally you want a polypropylene or a TPO anywhere where you're going to have airbag deployment. The side of the seat has an airbag that is gonna deploy out. When that deploys, this back panel needs to have some sort of a flex to get out of the way. You don't want it to break off a shard and send it flying. TPO or polypropylene will flex out of the way. So normally a back panel will want to be made out of this material. However, you cannot glue anything to polypropylene or TPO. Uh, the material is said to have a low surface energy. It is a, a polar resin as opposed to, uh, it is a uh, non-polar resin as opposed to a polar resin. All right, so this one has wrapping. We are gluing a vinyl material directly to this substrate. This is PCABS. PCABS, though it is strong, is brittle. This stuff will crack and break. So what is preventing it from throwing pieces? It's the wrapped cover itself. If this were to break, the cover acts as a tether, protecting it, keeping it from flying. But this material is needed if we're gluing anything to it. I was looking, this is a hot melt adhesive. This is a single cover, no sewing. So they were able to roll coat this flat piece of material with a hot melt, which is very efficient, very, very easy, and then wrap it directly to the substrate and then go through a heating press process. Now that is a little different here. This is the lower toe kick closeout. This is also a piece of plastic, has a piece of vinyl glued to it. This is not a hot melt. This is a sprayed water-based contact adhesive. All right, so that means if these are being produced in the same facility, they have different type of equipment for these two different components. It's a bigger floor space um, in their assembly plant, uh, multiple chemicals that they're having to handle. And to add added security, since this is a water-based material and also they have an exposed lip, they do a fold and a sew along the edges to seal up that material. It works, it's efficient. It would be nice if they were able to do this with the hot melt as well, so you have one um, type of system, don't have to purchase multiple, but that's okay. Um, I like plastics. The headrest. So we talked about how this headrest is coming in and actually locking in the back panel. Well, because of that, this is a fixed headrest. You cannot adjust that. You cannot change the angle. You cannot lift it up. I want to talk about headrest angle for a minute. In the past, if you had a seat, your headrest would basically just be an extension of the seat coming straight up off the back. In sedans, especially within the past 15 years, what are we doing? We are leaning back at a steeper and steeper angle. If this headrest was straight up and down while you're leaning back, your head is now being removed farther and farther from the headrest. So most headrests are now tipping farther and farther forward. I personally think it looks goofy in the vehicle. I hate it if I happen to be sitting straight up, but those headrest angles are a direct result of the way we are driving our cars now. 
You want to keep that distance between the back of your head and the headrest as small as possible in the crash event, preventing whiplash, things like that. So some vehicles are tipping the headrest forward. Some vehicles are just moving the entire headrest forward. Um, as long as they can design a seat that works for the widest range of the population with their headrest angle, then you really don't need an adjustable headrest, uh, whether tilt or up and down. Uh, we don't have that here with the Tesla, or I don't believe on any of the versions, and from the people who have driven this that I have spoken to, they weren't really bothered by it. I don't know how often you ever get a chance to look at a sewn seat cover. Um, these things have multiple different materials. You have vinyls that are glued or attached to some type of foam. You have different densities of foam, different thicknesses of foam, depending on where you're at in the vehicle. And then you have your primary attachments. Um, hook retainers, J retainers. There are different types of profiles that are all sewn in. Uh, these covers are quite nice because they can normally pack fairly well so that you can ship them from low cost countries for sewing uh, if that is of a benefit to you. Getting all the way up to the complete seat assembly. So who do we have or what do we have for a seat complete assembly? You have the structure, you have the foam, you have the cover, you have the back panels, you have all of the different mechanisms um, all coming together. So normally what you would have is you would have what is called a seat complete or a JIT, just in time assembly for the seat. They're going to bring in all of those components, put them together, ship the seat to the assembly plant. Um, I have been trying to figure out exactly how far Tesla goes in their own assembly. Some have said to me that Tesla assembles their own seats. Okay, so I want to know how many components are tes is Tesla actually producing themselves, or are they purchasing all of these individually, bringing them together to assemble? I don't know the answer to that. I would like to figure that out, and hopefully in future videos we can have that answer to really understand. So looking at the cost, what does that mean? All right, if I am a JIT assembly facility and I'm going to sell a finished seat, if I am making the structure, if I am making the sewn cover, if I'm making the plastics and then I'm being paid to assemble them all together, there's a lot of money there. However, I may actually cut my profit on any one component, knowing that I'm making my profit on the complete assembly. If Tesla is assembling this seat themselves, then all of these manufacturers need to get all of their profit out of the individual components that they're selling to Tesla. So there's a possibility that Tesla would be paying more money for all of this if they are assembling that themselves. I don't know that answer. I, I really would like to know. There's so much that goes into a seat. The safety aspect, the comfort aspect, the decision making behind all of this coming together. You could go for quite a while and then it would also get quite boring. And that's one thing that I hope not to do. Um, so I do believe for this, that would be all from an life. Thank you very much.